Our coverage of Hurricane Dorian continues as the system skirts up the eastern shores of the United States. Due to the sheer size of this storm, we're going to feel the impacts well outside of these outside lines because the cone has nothing to do with storm size. So storm surge alone is just what the water levels are going to increase by four to seven feet. A tall man is what we're going to increase the ocean height by. That's just the base of the ocean. Now add on top of it, high tide, and at this time of year in September, king tides, it's our highest tides of the year. Then we're going to add on top of it, 15 to 20 foot wave. So it's one, two, three things stacking up together on the east coast of Florida. As the center of this storm passes over the Bahamas, there will be a time mm -hmm. where conditions settle down because within the eye, it's usually dry, and sunny. That's right. But it's very misleading because once the other side of that eye approaches, those wind gusts and all those conditions mm -hmm. will pick up very quickly. Houston, up to the woodlands along Interstate 45, we have that threat for heavy rainfall because tropical systems, they don't just impact the coast, there are inland threats as well. The impacts, it's all with that rain. Remember, low pressure systems, all of them, they rotate counterclockwise, which means that with that rotation, we're just going to continue to pick up moisture from the Gulf and funnel it into southeastern Texas. And as we continue to see this storm march further to the north, conditions in Jacksonville, for instance, are going to be switching, at least in terms of those wind speeds. So there are going to be some very critical wind shifts occurring within the next couple of hours. Yeah, we'll be seeing that. And then uh, conditions go downhill for Savannah, for Charleston, and eventually on up into Myrtle Beach as well later on tonight. Still a long story to go here with this hurricane folks and we will continue to update you at weather nation we're looking at the current satellite imagery of hurricane dorian you can still see that central structure here that low just nestled off of the east coast of the florida georgia line basically at this point but what you notice is it's not quite that picturesque hurricane that we saw a couple days ago that's because this system is starting to lose a little bit of its internal structure that prettiness that eye that we often see that is starting to weaken and we've seen those maximum sustained winds slowly but surely decrease. But what I want you to see here is the sheer size of this storm. Considering the center is off of the coast of Florida, look how far up north it extends. We're starting to see those clouds pushing all the way through North Carolina and even into Virginia. And the more this system shifts north, the more those conditions will be shifting up the coast as well. So as we take a look now at the radar, you can see, of course, that counterclockwise rotation. A hurricane is, of course, just a very strong low pressure system. So any low pressure system in the northern hemisphere rotates counterclockwise. And that's also why we've got that banding that continues to move over much of Georgia, including Savannah, up towards Charleston, South Carolina. And then as we looked around the Jacksonville area where it's been coming down now pretty consistently, what happens a lot of times these bands track over the same spot hour after hour, which does lead to heavy rainfall. And over the past 24 hours, we have seen some of that. Upwards of one and a half to two inches of rain have been recorded in several spots in Northeast Florida. Florida. But notice how just to the north of Daytona Beach, you see that band of red. That's because we get very localized heavy rainfall. So it's not necessarily always that super widespread where we're talking about some of the most extreme rain. It can be very isolated. And of course, you put that in the wrong spot. For instance, some of our coastal cities that we're going to be dealing with this, it can be a uh, mess for disaster, a recipe for disaster. Now, I did mention a little bit of good news for folks across northeastern Florida. Notice how the center of that system sitting offshore. We've got offshore flow now in Jacksonville, in Daytona Beach. Well, Jacksonville, you're still a little north, northwest there, but look at the westerly flow across the Space Coast. That's finally pushing a lot of this water offshore. So that's the key. When you get on the southern side of the center, you're going to start to see offshore flow. Now, opposite story for folks in Georgia and South Carolina. Look at that northeasterly. It's either longshore or onshore flow, which means that we're going to start to really see that water begin to pile up and then just continue as the system moves to the north. That's where that storm surge concern comes into play. Now, on top of storm surge, let's add 12 to 20 foot seas. Start to get the picture here. You've got four to seven feet of storm surge, 28 foot seas possible, and then as if that weren't enough, we've got high tide to worry about across the area. So that's a look at some of the current conditions associated with Hurricane Dorian. And of course, we want to give you some of the latest forecast information because Chris, 
this system is just going to continue to impact folks along the East Coast. So if you're joining us from the Carolinas or even Virginia, any final preparations need to be rushed to completion because as we look ahead to your Thursday and then into the end of the week and this upcoming weekend, that's where we're going to see the closest impacts or the majority of the impacts associated with Dorian, anywhere from South Carolina further to the north. And you'll notice that the watches and warnings continue to expand up the eastern shores of the United States. Now we have that hurricane warning extend all the way to the North Carolina Virginia border in anticipation of hurricane force conditions arriving within the next 36 hours. So again, every county further north you head, you have a couple extra moments to do your final preparations. And I just want to emphasize that this storm should not be taken lightly because we are not ruling out landfall into one or both of the Carolinas as we go throughout the next couple of days. In addition to just the sheer winds that we're going to deal with, we've also got to be concerned, of course, with that storm surge. As Greg mentioned, winds are now moving offshore in Florida. That's going to push the water out. But as the system tracks to the north, we're going to be seeing that perpendicular approach to many of the coastlines of the Carolinas. And that means direct push of all of the water inland across the outer bay banks, the intercoastal waterways. We've got a lot of low lying also marshland across the area, all very susceptible to that storm surge inundation and flooding. So we'll continue to watch the storm again, track very slowly to the north, eventually making hopefully more of that northeasterly turn. But notice how close we are. We could be seeing the system either skirt and clip the coastline or move inland as we look ahead to Thursday and Friday. So I want to emphasize that all of those different possibilities, those different types, offshore skirting coastline or moving inland with landfall are all three still potential outcomes with this system. And as it skirts the coast, we're also going to have to look out for that tornado potential as well as a flash flooding potential. This will also be a large story for folks on the coast as well as inland, where we could be easily seeing a half a foot of rain or more through the end of the work week, which could lead to significant flash flooding concerns. More Hurricane Dorian coverage coming up here at Weather Nation. We'll keep tabs on places like Tybee Island as that surf pushes in.